Amen, amen, hallelujah. So you see the title of the sermon just next to me today, and that will tell you probably, you will know what text I'm going to, to start with, fan and to flame the gift of God. And this is an amazing uh, chapter, I think, that we can all uh, relate to uh, this uh, morning. Paul writing to uh, Timothy, his colleague, a word of encouragement for all of us. So let's, let's start reading our text this morning. To Timothy, our beloved son, I am thankful to God I, when I remember you in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded the sincere faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded in you, which dwelt in you also. So when Paul wrote this letter, 2 Timothy, his situation was changed drastically. He was a prisoner in a prison in Rome and probably facing a certain death. And uh, all of his companions in the ministry were away somewhere else in the ministry. So it was a very difficult time for him, uh, alone and facing a dark future. And uh, we have to identify with that also because we live ourselves in perilous time, different Different dangers, at a different time, different situation, but still now is also a difficult time for us. Uh, Paul and First Timothy had been writing to uh, Timothy, who was his young colleague at the time, and uh, we know from that letter that he was faithful. We know that uh, Timothy was timid. We know that he suffered from some physical condition. And we know that because of his personality, he would tend to let other people take advantage of him. He was not like a strong to affirm his leadership or as a pastor or spiritual authority, but people would uh, take advantage of him. So uh, Paul uh, addressed him as my beloved son, my dear beloved son. And we should remember that he was writing from a Roman prison, and he was in prison for preaching the gospel. And this was a time when Christian faith was uh, being attacked. They wanted to destroy the Christian faith, the go Roman government, and many believers had already been put to death. And yet Paul starts with, I thank God. And that is such an example for us. That's in the worst of conditions. We have a man of God who is an example and a model of faith. He says, I thank God, even though I'm in that kind of situation. So we know that uh, there's a, a lot of remember in this text. Uh, remember uh, you in prayer. Uh, remember your tears. And later on, remember your faith. And later on, he will even uh, exhort Timothy to remember the, the content message of the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of importance, stress put on remembering. And he knew that uh, sometime soon, Timothy would be left alone and he would be carrying the ministry for God. So, and also these tears reveal the closeness of a relationship. We don't know exactly what was the real cause of the tears that he was mentioned here. But we know that Paul was deeply impressed with the tears of his friend and colleague, uh, Timothy. Timothy was the third generation Christian when we think about it, the grandmother, the mother, and uh, he was next in the next generation. When Luke wrote about this family in Acts chapter 16, where he wrote that a certain disciple was there, his name was Timothy, the son of a certain woman, a uh, woman who was, who was a Jewess, a Jewess, and she was a believer. So we know that from Luke. But we don't have the impression that Luke really knew a lot about the inner working of the family, things that is so private as their personal faith. But Paul knew that because he mentioned it here. Louis, the grandmother, appears to have been the first convert to Christianity in the family. And she instructed her daughter Eunice, who be became a believer. 
and both of them influenced and brought up Timothy to the Christian faith. And he stressed again and again and again, we will never talk enough about this, the importance of the role of parents, of Christian parents, and the upbringing of uh, Christian and transmitting the faith, uh, passing an eternal legacy to the children and to the grandchildren. This is a very important principle in scriptures. You find it even in the book of Deuteronomy. You find it uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament and Proverbs. There's a lot of mentions about that in the New Testament as well. So the role of parents is very important. Then when Paul left Lystra, he took Timothy with him. We learned that from the book of uh, Acts. And he became, then started a, a relationship of a mentor to discipleship. And they uh, have developed. So through that very intimate relationship, uh, Paul knows and he is convinced of what kind of faith really Timothy has. And he talks and he compares his faith and he used the term sincere or genuine faith. But actually it's like a, a faith that is without dissimulation. It's a genuine faith. It's a faith that is solid, that is deep. He says that the faith that dwelt and the, the, the words used are important. That faith dwelt in your grandmother, and it dwelt also in your mother, and it dwells also in you. And I am convinced that it dwells in you. So Paul really knows about the personal faith. And we can ask ourselves a question this morning. What kind of faith do we have, really? Is that that sort of faith, like an unshakable faith, a deeper faith? Or is that more like a superficial faith, a Sunday morning faith, uh, following Jesus when everything goes well faith? Or a faith that has more importance on the temporal? I believe that God will bless me with uh, a job, with money, all this. What kind of faith do we really have? Or is that really Christ? centered is that eternity centered is that what sort of faith do we have it's good for us to ask that question this morning so paul was lonely facing death and he wanted to see his son in the faith he wanted his faith to keep on growing and uh, maybe just like us this morning uh, timothy became discouraged because of all the persecutions and because of all the difficulties in the ministry and became uh, overwhelmed with multiple difficulties that is surrounding him and his life and his time. But uh, we also have, as I said before, strong uh, adversity sometimes and strong uh, times of uh, sadness or where we feel burdened or overcome by the negative circumstances in our life. And it will be very good for us to follow Paul's advice uh, that, uh, this morning. For any Christian living in difficult times, whatever uh, sorts of difficult times you may be facing. And the first advice we find it in the Next slide, stir up the gift which is in you. I remind you, this is why, therefore, because I know that you have a strong, deep faith like your grandmother and mother, because of that, for this reason, I can tell you, stir up the gift that you have received from the Lord. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Or the, the fan into flame, the gift of God which is in you, depending on which Bible version you are looking. And the word here, stir up or fan into flame, is really when you break it, it's like uh, intensity. It's very intense. Bring alive and fire or lightning. All of these things are included in the Greek terminology. Rekindle. It's like a, a striking, uh, like a lightning striking. It brings alive. It is very intense. And it reminds me, the, uh, one, the last time we went to visit uh, my family, uh, my son had organized, we just arrived in Canada, we went to the campground. And um, 
it, it was raining sometimes, so at night we wanted to do campfires because that's what you do when you go camping. And the wood that we were using was a little bit damp. And it was burning, but it was always tending to lose its flame. And you want a, f a flame when you are having a campfire. And we kept the fanning. We kept fanning, fanning, and then whoop, the fire was coming bright. And then it would go away. So somebody else in the family, a grandson or the children or myself or anybody would go back and, you know, fan and fan and fan the, the flame. We wanted to do that. And the King James it says to enflame anew uh, the gift. And it's an interesting terminology, the gift of God, the charisma of God. Fan into flame, bring it anew, this flame, this fire of the charisma of God, which is in you. You have a charisma of God. I have a charisma of God. We have a charisma of God in us. And Paul was encouraging him to fan a flame anew so that it would produce in him, instead of a discouragement or timidity or fear, it would produce what I would call a courageous enthusiasm. We could say zeal or boldness, but let's use the expression courageous enthusiasm. The, the capacity, the willingness, the, the motives inside of us to, to bring strength in you and go on with that. And courageous enthusiasm is essential in our life if we want to move on. If you start your own company, you need to have courageous enthusiasm. If you want to succeed and pass your test, go to university, you need courageous enthusiasm. You need to believe in what you do and really give it your best. Otherwise, you cannot succeed in everything. In the first Timothy, in the first letter, Paul was writing something similar to Timothy. He says, do not neglect the gift, the gift of God which is in you. Do not neglect the gift of God. So in the first letter, it says, do not neglect this gift. In the second letter, it says, fan into flame the fire of this gift of God that is in you, this special inward ability, like a spiritual gift. The word charismata or charisma usually is charis, means grace, and charisma is like a gift of grace, and in the, in the first Corinthian, when we talk about the spiritual gifts, we use the charismata. It's like the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit that equip Christians so that we can exercise our ministry, live our Christian life, and keep our Christian witness. It is imparted to us by the Holy Spirit. And first Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7 says, But each has its own gift from God. Let's, let's pause for a moment on that. It's important for us today. Each has its own gift from God. That includes you. We cannot exclude ourselves this morning. Each one has that. And I want again to repeat this. The gift of God which is in you. And take a moment to think about the privilege that you have received. The gift of God which is in you. And then if you go to verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And we need to keep these two verses connected. They, they, they go together. We cannot. It's like a, a one sentence. That's why I remind you to fan into flame the spiritual gift or the gift of God, which is in you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. But he has given us a spirit of power. He has given us a spirit of love. He has given us a spirit of a sound mind. So that is what we have here. We can interpret the word spirit here. And Greek is pneuma. Uh, it's like the, the wind, the breath. Uh, it can be generally applied to wind or breath or spirit, human spirit. Or it can be the Holy Spirit. So whether it is the Holy Spirit, which I think it is, 
if if it is not then it would be the spirit of man under the the influence of the holy spirit anyway so whatever we read here is the charisma of god and because we read it so clearly the charisma of god it has to be the spirit of god god has not given us a spirit of god the the spirit that we have received is not to produce fear uh, whatever fear we have is doesn't come from that spirit of god it should be overcome fear doubts uh, hindrances to our faith should be uh, removed or banished because the spirit that god has given us the gift that god has given us is connected to the spirit of power and the word power here is the word dunamis again that that word that strong word the power of god the the, the miraculous power of god the uh, supernatural strength whether it is to perform miracles or whether it is to produce grace and inner strength to go on with your life and to be able to bear uh, difficult times and trials and adversities because the power of god has, has two main uh, functions one is to uh, allow you as his servant to perform miracles. When you pray and lay your hands, you can experience the miraculous power of God. This is dunamis power. But it is also when you go through uh, a, a, a sorts of adversity that is impossible for, for a human being to go through, uh, then you, and then you still can be... Uh, praising the Lord and, and, and strong in your faith. This is also another type of power of God working in, in, inside of you. The, the, the Greek word in that case would be energia, like the, uh, the inner working. And is inner, uh, uh, ergon means work. It works inside. So there's two forms of the power of God the outside work and the inside work, but here we are using the, the, the dunamis power. When you talk about uh, the, the spirit of love, again, this is another strong word in Greek, it's the agape love. It's not the eros, it's not the philia, it is the agape, it's the kind of love that is imparted by God is the, is the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives that sorts of love. If we are selfish, which is the opposite of that kind of love, uh, the greatest entrance to love is selfishness. So if we are selfish, in every situation or relationship, or even service God, we always uh, look for what we can get out of. That's, that's the mindset of selfishness. What can I get out of will motivate me to, to do something in actions. That is selfishness. But here we talk about agape. The love of God is different. The true Christian love is energized by the Holy Spirit, and it enables us to serve to humble, to, to also to sacrifice for others. That's, you need that sort of love to be able to overcome our natural selfishness and be able to uh, sacrifice and let other people have pre predominance over you. Uh, so otherwise, we cannot, we cannot do that. Uh, there's a, uh, I just want to, to read something to you. Here is uh, something I read this week about uh, someone who has defined what selfishness is not. Because usually we, we say what love is, what love is not, what selfishness is. But here is what selfishness is not. Uh, it is not about being happy, but about making happy. It is not about being loved, but about loving and being a blessing to each other. It is not about looking for profit, but about sharing with your neighbor what we have. It is not about stubbornly defending your opinion, but about giving up on yourself. It is not about finding your own satisfaction, but about being fulfilled when we satisfy others. I thought it is worth to, to read that because it gives us, uh, it's enlarged our understanding of what uh, true love, true Christian love should be. So it is not selfishness, it is the opposite way.
So if we come back to our, to our text here, you will see that these three words, spirit of power, spirit of love, and spirit of a sound mind, have, these three words are very important. I was thinking about that. It's very important for us today who lives life. Because the, the word spirit of power has to do with me, with you as an individual, uh, your, your, your personal strength, your, your, your character, your standing uh, in the faith, your confidence, your boldness. You are, you are living the Christian life assured of who you are or who Christ is, of the message of the gospel. It is you, the power, the, the, the spirit of power is you. It, it enables you to have that. The, the spirit of agape is also something very important because it deals with us and others. So the first one is you by yourself, you and God. The second one, you and your personality. The second one is you and relationship. We have relationship. Every day we have relationship. We always, uh, we are social. We wake up in the morning, you, you, you share, uh, probably you go to work, you go to school, any, anything we do. We, we, we have relationship. We go to church. We, are, we have relationships. So this power, this spirit of power, this spirit of love is very important because it, it enables us to live godly, to treat people uh, in the right way, to relate people in the name of Christ uh, and our relationship with others. And the third one is also very crucial for us because each one of us, the spirit of a sound mind, it's a special word also used here. Sound mind talks about sobriety, a sober mind. It talks about moderation. And this, this word is, uh, it deals with decision and actions. Each one of us, every day, we have lots of decisions. As some decisions that are small and, and in terms of its importance, but still we have to decide about all sorts of things. So uh, this is like a divinely given self-control in the face of panic or passions. It describes a person who has life under control. And the Amplified Bible, I think, uh, defined it very well. A calm and well-balanced mind with discipline and self-control. So if you put all of this together, it will define what this uh, Greek word means. Calm, well-balanced, because sometimes you have a, a situation that will overwhelm you, makes you very nervous and very stressed and very tense, and, this, and you need to make decisions, but you don't know what to do and, and how to go ahead, and you, you feel like uh, really panicking. So that spirit has given you a, that kind of a sound mind, sober mind, clarity of mind, so that when you will have to take, make decisions, you will make decisions calm, well-balanced, with a sort of self-discipline. It's very important. So when you, you, when you read uh, Paul's advice to Timothy, it's a very good advice to you and to me. It's a very, very practical and a very good advice for us today. And when we live in a, in a world, we have relationship, we have to deal with issues of faith, we, we have to make all sorts of decisions. So Timothy didn't need any new spiritual ingredients. All he had to do was stir up, fan into flame, the gift that God has already given to, to him. God's purpose for you and for me, it's more than making money. It's more than having a comfortable life. It is really to use the gifts. Think about it. He has given us a charisma, which is in me, which is in you. God wants us to use that and live because it will enable us to do what he wants us to do. Uh, no matter how much talent and training and experience you have, it cannot replace or substitute the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The second section that we are going to look at is do not be ashamed. The idea is do not be ashamed. 
Uh, Paul was not ashamed. We read it in the beginning uh, of the chapter, in the middle of the chapter. Uh, he encouraged Timothy not to uh, be ashamed as well of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now Paul is going further and telling him how he is going to let God guide him, let God uh, use the gifts that he has given him. In this text, you realize that it is inevitable if you are a Christian, if you want to be loyal to the, Christ, to the gospel, it is unavoidable that you will face some trouble. But Paul is insisting it is a gospel worth suffering for. It is a gospel worth uh, going through some afflictions for. The gospel is worth all of the afflictions, all of the trials, all of the difficulties that are linked to the gospel and your life and your testimony. It is worth it. You know, we often fail to understand that it was not easy to follow a crucified master. Remember the time in which Paul is writing, in which Timothy is living, in the context of the Roman Empire. Christ had been crucified, and they are following uh, a crucified man whom they claim is risen from the dead. Today, uh, someone says, we have sanitized Jesus, and we have disinfected the cross, making it safe. So for us, we like it safe. We follow Jesus because it, it's safe. It, it brings us benefit. The way we understand and live the gospel for most of the Western world, it's, it's kind of easy. And it brings benefit. Uh, it promised the, the faithfulness of God will bless your life, you know, will help you and everything that you do. You pray. God is on your side. So it's not our, our Christianity is not often depicted as a troubled Christianity, as a suffering Christianity, as a price to pay Christianity. It's not so much uh, brought to, to, to reality as it was in the time of Paul and Timothy. So you can imagine that at the, in the time that Paul wrote this message, it would seem strange for a Roman citizen to find someone following a crucified man and call him savior. You, can, you, you get the point? It's, it's hard for these people. And yet, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the testimony uh, to, to stand for your own testimony in, in, in view of the the Lord Jesus Christ, and of me. I'm in prison for the gospel, so don't be ashamed also of that. So he's bringing the perspective of, of that uh, in, in, in a way. Be a partaker with me of the afflictions of the gospel. That's the word. And pay attention to that because it says, you can do that by the power of God. Again, it goes back to the power of God. It goes back to the gift of God. It goes back to the flame uh, of that gift in you according to the power of God, the dunamis of God that is in you. That is how we can. Nobody by nature enjoys suffering. Nobody looks for trouble and enjoys suffering. But our gospel is a gospel of power. It empowers us and be able to face difficult time, difficult situation because of this. You know, sometimes suffering is part of God's will. It's true. For some people, more than others, we don't know. For sometimes, it doesn't seem, it may not seem that it is 
at that moment for you or for me a time of suffering, but it may become at some point in the future. Uh, uh, for many Christians and many countries, it is. That is text would be very, very, uh, uh, they would connect with that text much more than us because their daily life, if you go to Bangladesh, if you go to different countries, uh, uh, different place where it is uh, other religion control or India, Hinduism, uh, if you go to Sri Lanka, you will face that. If you go to many countries, you will see in Indonesia, you will face that, you will connect with this text much, much more. So sometimes suffering is part of the will of God for Christians who live at certain place and at certain time. But it is also a gospel of salvation. And the emphasis is on grace. Uh, Jesus Christ destroyed death and he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That is when we understood, that is when we got to know what's our future to be like. Uh, our future is going to be in immortality. That's where we are going. And it's good to be reminded as COVID is affecting people all around, there are many people who have lost loved ones. Uh, you know, in certain countries, it's by the thousands. So there would be like where, where people are living with clusters. It, it, if you have not lost somebody, then it's, it's, it's easier to, to distinguish, to separate yourself from that pain. But how many thousands of people have lost someone to, to COVID, for example? And it is a very important time to remember that in the gospel, there is immortality that is promised for those who believe. And Jesus Christ brought this hope to light. It brought it clear, clear without doubt. And he proved it. It's not only a doctrine or, or a pretension or uh, something announced like politicians made an empty promise. He showed it to the world by raising from the dead. So it is sure. And it, it tells us uh, that we... I was talking, thinking about... Uh, uh, how we go into immortality this week. And a picture came to my mind. It's an illustration. Uh, no illustration is perfect. So, uh, but it helped me to understand something. We often read the text, Jesus says, uh, the dead will come back to life. Uh, it says it in the Gospel of John. It says also that those who believe in me... Uh, are not going to taste death. They're not going to see death, even though they die. They're not going to die. So, okay, that's something that we get, but we don't understand. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that flesh and blood, as, as, our, as we are right now, and, and the natural conditions necessary to live on this planet Earth with water and air and all of this, uh, flesh and blood cannot inherit the state of immortality. It, it, a transformation needs to take place. So, okay, another thing that we don't understand. But I was thinking of how a baby is born, how it happened. And, and it, it encouraged me a lot. It just popped into my mind one day. The baby is living in the water in the mother's womb. He's in, he's in water. He's swimming. <laughs> and he's alive. He's breathing in a state of life. He's being developed in the mother's womb. It is in liquid. And then suddenly, you hear the scream of the baby. And now he has become a, a, a living being in this environment where he needs to breathe. But it's impossible. He came from water. And now he is in air. So if you take a fish from the ocean and you bring it in the air, what will happen? But for a baby, it's not. He becomes a living being. He has adapted automatically to that state of life. And that has, anyway, encouraged me to understand that transformation from living now this earthly life and being transformed in a twinkling of an eye where flesh and blood cannot inherit, 
but this passing into the immortality, I, I don't know, I just got, I hope I'm encouraging you and saying something like that to you, but we are going to pass from this earthly life into a state of eternity at some point. And Jesus Christ brought it to light. It brought it to, to you and me so that we can understand that. And when you consider the greatness of this message, no wonder why Paul calls it the good news. And then he encourages his friend Timothy about the good news. It is a good news that God, through this text, says that he thought of you and he loved you before the world even existed. That is beyond our understanding. It's a good news that he called you and that he saved you. It is a good news that he gave us a helper. After he saved us, he gives us a helper to uh, enable us, to give us a gift that he walks with us, a helper. He's not leaving us an orphan. We have the Holy Spirit all along in our life supplying the power, the love, the sound mind, the, everything that we need that is necessary, it comes from the Holy Spirit. And it is a good news because we can see where we're heading in the glorious uh, eternal future and immortality. So we finish with this text here. Uh, so Paul says to Timothy, keep or protect or guard the good thing that have been entrusted to you through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And again, you have the power of the Holy Spirit that helps you guard it and everything. It refers to the truth of the gospel. Timothy was in a time of transition. Soon, Paul would not be there, and he would be a mature pastor, church leader, an influencer, a leader. If he would guard what the Lord entrusted to him. There's this thing about uh, everything that we have read today about this. So when you face difficult situation, a transition in your life, uh, adversities, let's follow Paul's advice to Timothy. Examine your experience because we know the plan of God. He wants us to use the gift of the Holy Spirit. Use the gift that has been given to you. I want to uh, look at uh, and close with these few thoughts here. Different things that we have discussed in this message and the advice of Paul. And verse 14 says, keep the good things, the, 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 the message of the gospel, the, the gift of the Lord. Keep it through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. But then before that, he says, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. The spirit God gave us fills us with power, with love, and with a sound mind. Take part in sharing afflictions for the gospel by the power of God. It's all about the power of God. It's all about the ministry, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, there is also the quench not the Holy Spirit that you read in First Thessalonians and First Timothy chapter one. Uh, do not neglect the gifts of the of, of God, but instead fan into flame, stir up the gift and and guard it. And it is very important to realize that this advice is given by a man that is near to face death. You know, many people speak uh, about the final words of someone who is going to die. And sometimes it will be a, 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 a well of wisdom. They have lived a long life. They are near death and they are going to transmit whatever w amount of wisdom that they have uh, got and everything. Human history is filled with discussions about what it means to die well and... Uh, and what kind of life will prepare you to die well? So, and for that, you need to have a real example of someone who can show you how to live well and how to die well. And this is exactly what we have in this text here. If you realize that Paul is near death, 
he know he knew he, he writes about immortality he writes about living strong for the lord about not being ashamed of his faith knowing that soon because of the gospel he will be put to death and yet he gives the advice and encouragement to his young friend he says don't be ashamed of me don't be ashamed of the testimony about the lord jesus christ go on stir up the gifts go on stir up the gift because the, all the power that you need is the power of god is the power of the holy spirit stir up the gift and you will be fine go on go on how to live and how to die paul gives us in, in the uh, instructions he is the man who is going to be there soon and he is transmitting all this well unto us and we need to keep that in our mind as we live our life be immortality centered when we live with jesus amen hallelujah so let us stand this morning and stir up the gifts that is in us and we need to ask ourselves the question what is it lord that you deposit in me what is it lord that i need to fight for what i what is it lord that i need to restore what is it lord that i need to focus on oh lord i'm depending upon you for the success of my christian life oh lord what is it that you want me to to do to serve you and to uh, walk with you and to influence other people and to prepare myself for eternity but also bring as many people in eternity as well lord you gospel it's a gospel worth suffering for your gospel is a gospel of salvation your gospel is a gospel of power and we have all of this and lord thank you for giving us this word of advice this morning that we need to fan into flame this gift of god the desire of god the plan that god has and giving us these gifts these supernatural abilities these direction this wisdom the power the love and the sound mind that you are putting into us lord thank you father strengthen us strengthen our faith in the last days that we live strengthen the church the the testimony of our church strengthen lord and we pray for one another this morning strengthen uh, fan into flame stir up the gifts of brothers and sisters in the church that we will not be ashamed we will not be timid but we will be Uh, having a, a courageous enthusiasm, a, a zeal, a boldness, a, a renewed desire uh, that we will live with diligence and we will be motivated to be a servant in the name of Christ. Lord, we have so much things to do by the power of God. Thank you for the good news. Thank you for bringing to light the hope and the assurance of immortality and lord god help us to live for you in the name of jesus amen 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 hallelujah praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah praise god amen thank you for being here this morning god loves you we were preparing for a full room maybe next time but we are glad that you came that you are safe and god bless you at home all those of you who are watching with us we we love you and we will see you soon praise the lord praise the lord praise god <laughs>